Hello, and welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. Today's episode is one of our bonus episodes. This is a time where we sort of break from the narrative history of the main series and talk about some of the ideas uh, going on uh, with history. And this episode is a little bit of an oddball because it comes right in the middle of a sequence on the American Revolution. Here's what's going on. Uh, Within the past month, I've had a couple of major changes in my life. Uh, For one thing, I've taken a new job. Uh, This won't have any impact on the series, positive or negative, in the long term. Uh, But in the short term, it's meant that I've had some things to learn and uh, been spending a little more mental energy on my day job than I normally do. The other thing is uh, that I quit drinking. Uh, This is something that I had not thought had been a problem for me, and uh, turns out it was. And, uh, well, I have addressed that problem, but as it turns out, when uh, you quit drinking, it can lead to uh, short-term depression, which I've been dealing with a little bit, and between that and the new job, it's just been hard to study and focus and dig into the history books like I, well, like I have to do to put out a good quality episode. And, uh, well, with the last episode, all of the sort of hard behind-the-scenes work was already done. The script was basically written, and all I had to do was record and edit it, which is not only easy, but kind of fun. As it stands for the next American History episode, I do have several pages of a script complete, but not something that I was ready to bring to you yet. So instead, I decided to go with this bonus episode, which is something I had intended to introduce after the sequence on the American Revolution, and that is the subject of presentism. Now, this is a controversial issue. It's one of those things that's sort of Dan's opinion more than you know, solid historical fact, but it's something I wanted to address, and it's a trend that's going on in the world of history study. And what presentism is, is the application of modern-day values to history and historical figures. In other words, essentially judging people from the past by modern standards. Now, the term presentism can mean many things in many fields. For example, it's a term used in literature. It's used in moral philosophy. Uh, So when we're talking about history, presentism really specifically refers to historical figures. It's not this sort of broader sense that you can get into in other fields. That said, what I wanted to talk about today will be sort of touching on philosophy and political theory and things of that nature that we don't normally go as deeply into on this show. Now, presentism, from what I've seen, is largely an American phenomenon for the time being, but be careful, those of you who are listening from overseas, because as we all know, when America sneezes, the Western world gets a cold. What am I talking about with presentism? Or specifically, uh, more to the point, what am I objecting to? Well, I'm objecting to some of presentism's uglier manifestations, and I'll 
give you one example that comes to mind because it's relatively close to where I live. There's an American revolutionary figure named Philip Schuyler. Uh, that's spelled S-C-H-U-Y-L-E-R. And there is a statue of him in front of the City Hall building in Albany, New York. Schuyler was a significant figure during the American Revolution, among other things. He was the father-in-law of Alexander Hamilton, and he's one of America's founding fathers. But the city is taking down his statue because he had 17 slaves during his lifetime. And for that reason, despite his contributions to the American Revolution and the creation of the country, it is now thought inappropriate to display his statue in public, and it's being taken down and put into storage. This is the application of modern-day perspectives to a historical figure. Last summer, on August 17th, James Sweeney, a historian and the president of the American Historical Association, published an article called Is History History? And in it, he argued against this trend of presentism, of using modern values to interpret history, at least as a primary means of interpreting history. And Sweet writes about taking a visit to Ghana, which is a country in West Africa. And while there, he tours one of the fortresses, which was a hub of the slave trade. And Sweet writes, quote, the Almina tour guide claimed that Ghanaians sent their servants into chattel slavery unknowingly. The guide made no reference to warfare or indigenous slavery, histories that interrupt assumptions of ancestral connection between modern-day Ghanaians and visitors from the diaspora. Similarly, the forthcoming film The Woman King seems to suggest that Dahomey's female warriors and King Gezo fought the European slave trade. In fact, they promoted it. Historically accurate rendering of Asante or Dahomeyan greed and enslavement apparently contradict modern-day political imperatives. Hollywood need not adhere to historians' methods any more than journalists or tour guides, but bad history yields bad politics. The erasure of slave-trading African empires in the name of political unity is uncomfortably like right-wing conservative attempts to erase slavery from school curricula in the United States, also in the name of unity. These interpretations are two sides of the same coin. If history is only those stories from the past that confirm current political positions, all manner of political hacks can claim historical expertise, end quote. This might make it sound like James Sweet is uh, some sort of right-wing figure criticizing a woke interpretation of history, but it's not just an issue on the political left uh, for Sweet. He goes on to talk about a pair of U.S. Supreme Court rulings on gun control and abortion, and on these issues he criticizes Supreme Court Justices Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito, respectively. And for foreign listeners, those are right-leaning judges on the U.S. Supreme Court that Sweet is criticizing. In other words, his issues here are not partisan. They span the political spectrum, and it's all the same thing. He's talking about the cherry-picking of historical narratives to fit modern political sensibilities or agendas. And while Sweet's arguments were a bit scattershot, he covers a lot of ground in a fairly short essay, uh, he's not wrong, in my opinion. 
but he raised some controversial issues, so it's not surprising that he faced backlash, mostly on Twitter. He would be forced by the American Historical Association to issue an apology uh, and would be barred from publishing his response to his critics. And while he did ultimately write the apology, and it's a bit disappointing, I could understand why with the career pressures he was under. Presentism is a big problem today. Sweet, in his essay, also talks about an increase in students studying modern history, that is, history from the year 1800 and later. And the figure he cites here is that these students have increased by 18% from 2003 to 2013, and that over the same time period, there was a decrease of 4% in students studying uh, pre-1800 history, and that this shift to studies of a more modern era creates a bias in the historical field. Sweet says, quote, As the discipline has become more focused on the 20th and 21st centuries, historical analyses are contained within an increasingly constrained temporality. Our interpretations of the recent past collapse into the familiar terms of contemporary debates, leaving little room for the innovative, counterintuitive interpretations. This trend towards presentism is not confined to historians of the recent past. The entire discipline is lurching in this direction, including a shrinking minority working in pre-modern fields. If we don't read the past through the prism of contemporary social justice issues— race, gender, sexuality, nationalism, capitalism, are we doing history that matters? This new history often ignores the values and mores of people in their own times, as well as change over time, neutralizing the expertise that separates historians from those in other disciplines. End quote. The issue of Presentism is particularly relevant where we stand in the series because we're discussing the American Revolution, and one of the elephants in the room here is that many of the founding fathers of the United States are slaveholders. As these people are writing and talking about things like representative democracy and human liberty, they are simultaneously claiming ownership over other human beings and torturing them and all kinds of horrible stuff. So how do we treat these figures? Obviously, there are some serious issues with these guys if we judge them by modern standards. But I would propose that people in the past are like aliens or like people from vastly different foreign cultures. This is a common view among historians, right? Different people in different places have different values, and the past is a different country. So it's not entirely accurate to apply our moral or ethical lens to people who are long past. And to demonstrate this, I want to talk about nine specific errors in presentism. And then I'll also talk about some of the things that its proponents say that it has to bring to the table and give my thoughts on those things. Now, Before we start, I want to address uh, what I'm not going to address. In my preparation for this episode, I tried to listen to and read as many arguments in favor of presentism as I could. And the 
majority of these arguments, I would say well over half, uh, centered around the idea of including historical accounts that have traditionally not been part of the mainstream because the mainstream has been, at least in the West, dominated by white men. So we're talking about uh, stories, for example, uh, from female historical figures who may have been underappreciated or accounts from slaves during American colonial times that may not have been part of the traditional historical narrative. And, well, I agree with what these people are saying, that all of these accounts are important, but that's not presentism. Right? Listening to accounts from people who have not traditionally been listened to is not in and of itself a present bias. It may be something that people didn't do in the past, but done properly, it does not involve placing the moral or political views of the historian onto the history. Right? It's just adding to the historical knowledge and listening to more voices. And you know, that's not a problem. A good example of this, uh, you know, in terms of things that my audience may be familiar with. If you listen to Dan Carlin, he recently did an episode called Celtic Holocaust, and he's talking about uh, Julius Caesar's conquest of the Gauls, but how, you know, from the perspective of the Gauls, well, it looks kind of like the Holocaust. It looks like just this horrific conquest and how our views of Julius Caesar and the Romans are colored by the fact that when we read the historical accounts, we're getting only their side of the story, right? But that's not presentism, right? That's just considering another side of the story. Presentism, what I'm talking about is the historian or it, in the case of a podcaster or somebody like that, in my case, the non-historian, whoever is doing history, applying their individual modern values to the story. That's presentism. And that's what I'm going to argue against. And the other thing I want to clarify before I get into my specific critiques of presentism is that many of my specific arguments will make an underlying assumption, and it's a moral and ethical assumption. This is a debatable assumption, as most of these things are, but it's a popular and common assumption amongst philosophers. You will find it expressed by Many people from St. Augustine in the late 4th and early 5th century all the way up to Sam Harris today. And that is the position that while morality, or you know, one might say uh, moral laws, do not change over time, social mores, in other words, how we specifically adhere to those laws, do change from time to time. Augustine argues a good example of this uh, when he argues in favor of monogamy. And now Augustine is a Catholic bishop, and he has to square this with you know, the fact that polygamy is all over the Old Testament. You know, all of these old uh, Israelite kings all have many wives and harems and stuff, so how do you square this with Christian doctrine and what Augustine says is that, well, there are certain underlying eternal moral rules, for example, that you should always follow and honor your marriage vows, but that you know, how we follow those moral laws changes. And well, back in the day, people weren't quite ready for monogamy just yet, and so we had polygamy. And that's an example of mores versus morality. Uh, regardless of your position on, on polygamy or anything like that, that's an example of, of what uh, the difference is between a moral law, per se, and a social more. So, nine errors in presentism. Error number one. 
This is a common one you will see, and it's failure to consider a counterfactual. People will criticize someone in history for making a bad decision without fully thinking through what that person's alternatives were. A good example of this is the widespread criticism in recent years of the U.S. use of nuclear bombs on Japan at the end of World War II. People will say this was unnecessary. It was excessively violent at a time when Japan was already on its knees. Right. Why kill that many thousands and thousands of people? Isn't that a horrible thing to do? Well, you have to consider the alternative. Because... At some point, you have to get Japan to surrender. If you don't, they're just going to continue engaging in war on the Asian mainland, right? They're still fighting in China in 1945, and some of what the Japanese are doing in China makes the Nazis look almost like teddy bears. I mean, just horrific atrocities against the Chinese people, and atrocities are happening every day that Japan is not forced to surrender. So you can spare those people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but while you're sparing them, while you're still trying to talk things through, every day people are dying in China. Or you have the insane alternative of, you know, a allied invasion of the Japanese mainland. You're talking about millions dead. That's way more people than killed by the atomic bombs and way more destruction to the nation of Japan and the infrastructure and all that that means more dead people down the road. World War II was a terrible time. None of the alternatives were good. So to criticize American war planners overmuch for dropping the bombs seems a bit presumptuous of anyone who didn't have to make that decision. Error number two with presentism. And it deals in absolutes. For example, the idea that democracy is objectively good. This is something most people in modern Western countries take for granted, but it's not universal by any means, especially throughout history. And to just assume that democracy is objectively good when you're telling a historical story, well, it ignores the perspectives of many people during whatever time you're talking about, and it's overly simplistic. Say It ignores their perspectives most of the time. There will be times where everybody believes in democracy, but that is the exception, not the rule. If you read Socrates, if you read Plato, Socrates argues for an enlightened monarchy in the Republic. Many people have believed in this and in similar ideas. And this leads people to commit real errors in real life, right? If you view history as just this endless march from oppression towards a pluralistic democracy, you make mistakes like the U.S. war planners going into Iraq and just assuming that if you get rid of the dictator and call for an election that everything's going to go well. Well, it turns out that tribal loyalties and traditional gripes within the society, well, these supersede any imagined desire for freedom and democracy that Western people try and project on folks from this other society. That's 
a real cost to taking this sort of presentist idea, which in this case, uh, democracy specifically isn't just biased in terms of time, it's also biased in terms of being a purely Western perspective. And we can name all kinds of absolutes like this that people just assume and then slap onto a historical narrative, and it prevents us from looking at history from the same perspective as the people who lived it. Error number three with presentism, and this isn't so much an error, strictly speaking, with presentism, but with its practitioners, and that is that presentism is unfair to individuals. People who analyze history from a presentist perspective are often, not always, but often prone to portray historical figures as either good or evil. Everything is a morality play for these folks, and that's not how real life works, is it? Real people are complex. A good example is a figure we've spent a lot of time talking about on the channel over the past year, and that's Frederick the Great, the King of Prussia. Who is this guy? And on the one hand, he's out there conquering Silesia and then later on participating in the dismemberment of Poland. On the other hand, he promotes religious freedom, including for Jewish people, and during his time, he reopens the Berlin Academy, a internationally renowned university that employs luminaries like Leonard Euler and Joseph Louis Lagrange and others, right? People who are still famous today, who Frederick brings to Prussia. So is he a progressive Enlightenment monarch or is he a rapacious conqueror? He's both. He's neither. Depends whether you ask a Pole or a German, most likely. But it's not just one or the other. Error number four with presentism is that it often involves a failure to give credit. And with this error, I'm specifically looking at the progressive view of history, this idea that I could argue with this idea too, but it's an idea many people believe that you know, the arc of history inevitably bends towards liberality and progress and that this is sort of inevitably happening all the time. Well, if you believe that the arc of history bends, then it follows that that arc bends in a series of stages. We make one progressive step, and then another, and then another, and so on. And in that case, don't past generations deserve credit for their achievements? This is really my beef with the way many people talk about America's founding fathers these days is they look at you know, a lot of the bad things from our modern perspective that these guys were doing, and they will talk a lot about that and neglect to recognize uh, you know, this idea of an ever-expanding circle of political and human rights, and you know, this circle at first will only encompass a few people and then more and more and more over time. And well, if the Founding Fathers widened that circle a little bit, why throw shade at them instead of giving them credit? It is fundamentally unfair. Error number five with presentism is sort of the flip side of this is that it often involves giving credit to people or civilizations for reasons that are not really legitimate. And a good example of this is the Mongols. They get credit for 
cross-pollinating Chinese and Islamic and European culture. They restore the Silk Road. They bring gunpowder to Europe. If you listen to a lot of people talk about the Mongols, it's well, not so much today, but at least you know, up to you know, at least just a few years ago, people would often simply talk about all the good results of the Mongol conquest, and they would completely ignore the murder and violence that went along with all that. Like the Mongols killed something like 20% of the population of the world. When scientists go back and look at the carbon record, they can see a dip in carbon emissions during the Mongol times. That's how many people they killed. And yet so often we talk about all well, the good things that came out of all this. Somehow I think if you were an inhabitant of the city of Samarkand in Central Asia being lined up to have your head chopped off, you might have something different to say about the Mongols. To return again to Dan Carlin, uh, he sort of proposes an, an interesting uh, example of how this might play out in the future. Right? Can you imagine a future historian writing about the existence of the state of Israel and starting out their account by saying, well, it all started when the Nazis uh, came to power in Central Europe and you know, they uh, inspired the Jews to start their own state. I mean, I guess if you want to talk about history in the loosest terms, but that's sort of ignoring the millions of people who had to die for you to get to that point. Right? The Nazis certainly deserve no credit for anything quote-unquote good that you know, resulted down the road for future generations. So let's not when we're looking at history, shoot an arrow and then paint a target around it afterwards that can lead to some really, really bad reasoning. Error number six with presentism is that it completely ignores a good portion of pre-modern history. Right? Oftentimes in the past, right, in this era we're talking about before the year 1800, i.e. most of human history, people are often thinking and acting upon debates and ideas and values that have nothing to do with the debates and ideas and values that are trendy today. I remember when I was doing one of the episodes on the Crusades and I was reading one of the medieval sources and smack in the middle of talking about this war, the author just takes a break for 10 to 12 pages to talk about this person in France who is seeing some visions of a saint and how these monks are, you know, leading pilgrimages to this village for uh, people to come see this supposed visionary. You know, it's this complete diversion from the crusade into a modern person. It makes absolutely no sense. But what I got out of it was that it shows what the author valued, right? To the person who wrote this account, this local religious event near where they were living was just as important as this war hundreds of miles away. Along the same lines, if we go back to stuff we've talked about in even earlier episodes, think about the 
split between Aryan Christianity and Nicene Christianity in the early eras of Christianity, and uh, you have people fighting over obscure points of Christian doctrine, right? Was Jesus created by God the Father, or was he here for all eternity, right? These are things that even people who are really religious today don't get too worked up about. Right? Most of us don't even care. But in the past, people were killing their neighbors over this kind of stuff. And if you can't get your head around the fact that something that Today, we would consider you know, an obscure point of religious doctrine was a matter of life and death for people in an earlier era. Well, we lose something about their story. Error number seven with presentism is it presents a skewed view of history to the public. And here I'm talking not so much about academic writing, but I'm talking here about presentism in popular culture. And you could <laughs> just bring up a random page in the historical drama section on IMDb, and I guarantee you whatever movie or show you land on is going to be full of anachronisms. But just to use one example, take the movie the, the Patriot with Mel Gibson. In that movie, the hero is a South Carolina plantation owner who somehow doesn't have any slaves. No, all of the people who work on his farm are free laborers. Why? Because he's the hero of the story. See, he can't do anything bad, so... We have to create this completely unrealistic scenario. And on the flip side, we have a scene where the British literally burn down a church where they have boarded up a bunch of civilians inside. And why do the British do this? Because they're the bad guys. Well, had the British actually done something like this, during the American Revolution, it would have been considered beyond the pale. We would still be talking about it today. Whatever British officer had ordered the massacre would have been court-martialed and probably executed for something that even then, um, amongst British society, would have been considered a war crime. But having this heroic plantation owner with his free laborers and the evil British who burn up civilians in churches, well, it makes the story easy to digest for modern audiences. Never mind what they might actually come out of that movie theater thinking about the American Revolution. Let's just tell a good story, right? That is presentism in pop culture in a nutshell. Error number eight, presentism gives cheap answers. The kind of presentism I am talking about involves a desire to render a moral judgment. So if we're judging Alexander the Great, for example, we might say, he conquered a bunch of the world because he was greedy and wanted power. Well, I can't necessarily argue with that, but it doesn't provide a deep, satisfying answer as to why. Yes, Nazis are racists and evil, but why? What is it that takes an ordinary person and makes them want to support genocide? That's the interesting question. If you're trying to draw lessons from history, that's where you're going to find them. Not in some caricature 
that's made to score political points on Twitter. Error number nine with presentism. And that is the growing trend of scholarship as a form of activism. And we're talking about two things that are fundamentally incompatible. A good example of this and how it can both go very right and very wrong at the same time is Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States. This is a book written in 1980, and it is a leftist history of the United States with a lot of stories you won't get in mainstream historical writings from the 20th century. So, for example, Zinn writes a lot about the labor movement and various strikes in the early 20th century and collusion between the government and rich industrialists to put down those strikes. Very important stuff that, incidentally, had been suppressed due to a type of presentism of its own, right? During the 20th century, the middle of the 20th century, the U.S. is involved in the Cold War with the Soviet Union. And so anything that smacks of a pro-labor or left-of-center viewpoint is seen as suspect. And so the labor movement in histories from that era is sort of glossed over. And from that perspective, Zinn's history is a very useful thing to come out in 1980 when it does, and it remains very influential today. But at the same time, in all of a people's history of the United States, Howard Zinn hardly mentions religion at all. And this is the case when, for most of its history, the U.S. is a very religious nation. I mean, it's still an unusually religious country for a Western nation. Well, Zinn is, of course, a materialist, uh, which is fine. Uh, but if you're going to talk about a country that was founded in large part by Puritans... You need to talk about religion at least a little bit, right? As a historian or a fan of history or a history writer or whoever you are, you don't have to agree with whoever you're writing or talking about, but you have to account for their beliefs and you have to do it honestly. So I've talked a fair bit now about the issues with presentism, but... You know, I want to be fair, and before uh, sort of wrapping up here, I want to talk about some of the arguments people will make in favor of presentism and well, provide my thoughts on those. Uh, one of the major points in favor of presentism is that it's unavoidable. 19th century German historian and founding father of the modern historical profession, Leopold von Ranke, writes, quote, That history is always rewritten has already been remarked. Every age in its dominant tendency makes history its own and transfers its thoughts onto it. Would one study history at all without the impulse of the present? End quote. And this is true. My show, this show that uh, you are listening to right now, is relevant history. And I'd hate to think that I was covering some irrelevant historical event that had no long-term repercussions and no real relevance for our modern world. So in that sense, uh, yes, every age and every society is going to have its own view of different historical events. And that's not just unavoidable, it's part of the fun of studying history. Another point in favor of presentism is that it is sometimes accurate. It's not always fallacious. 
In his article, In Defense of Presentism, British historian David Armitage says that if you're writing a history of the bubonic plague, for example, it's stupid to ignore modern germ theory. We wouldn't take seriously any claims that the plague is caused by witchcraft or divine punishment or anything like that. We read about the plague and we say, oh, there's a bacterial infection going around. And Armitage calls this empirical presentism. Right? We don't ignore modern scientific knowledge uh, just because we're reading about the past. Uh, but remember the caveat here that if people at the time believe that you know, the plague is caused by witchcraft or that it's divine punishment for something, that this belief is going to affect their behavior, and so you have to account for that. Returning to popular culture for a second, presentism can sometimes be helpful as much as it can be hurtful. Uh, a couple of examples here. Uh, to begin with, swearing, uh, profanity, hits harder if people use modern curse words. If you follow the YouTube channel Shadversity, or you're familiar with it, Shad does a whole episode on medieval cursing, and people would, you know, as is befitting for the times, they would say things about religion, like, by the virgin, or by Christ's blood, you know, those things would be really offensive in medieval Europe, right? They, whereas, you know, the, uh, the F word or something like that would, would just not be considered off-putting at all at those times, right? Uh, standards change. Uh, but if you're writing a TV show and you have all your characters using medieval cursing, well, it probably sounds silly to a modern audience, right? If your character's going to drop an F-bomb, have them drop an F-bomb. Right? The last thing you want is to make your audience laugh. Although, at the same time, presentism can be incredibly valuable and is often indispensable for satire. And a perfect example of this is Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And just one example of this here is the scene where they're talking politics with the peasants, and the one peasant has the monologue about, you know, strange women giving out swords being no foundation for government, and how government derives from the consent of the people, and then, you know, they're having one of the peasants hauled off, and he says, help, help, I'm being repressed, right? None of that makes any sense at all if you're watching it from a medieval perspective. It's only funny if you're watching that with modern sensibilities in mind. Presentism also has something accurate to say when presentists will point out that traditional heroes were often uh, evil or bad by their own contemporary standards. Right. Take somebody like Columbus, for example. Right. You don't have to use a modern moral and ethical lens to pass judgment on him and say that he was probably the bad guy most of the time, right? This is a guy who enslaves entire tribes, and he does so with violence that shocks even your other conquistadors. Right? After one revolt, he has a, a whole bunch of the rebelling Native Americans dismembered and then has the various body parts paraded around on spears throughout the settlement to discourage further resistance. I mean, this is horror movie stuff, and ultimately he's recalled to Spain, he loses his governorship, he loses his reputation, right? Even the Spanish imperialists want nothing to do with this guy by the end of his career. So, one does not have to be a presentist to judge Columbus. Many of his fellow Spaniards did that. Well, this is... Certainly true, and you know, I won't 
argue with the presentists over Columbus, for example, but remember that some of these historical figures can also inspire. It's not just people in the United States who celebrate Columbus Day. It's many people throughout many countries in the Americas who celebrate uh, the legacy of Christopher Columbus of bringing Europeans to the Americas, however you may think about that. right? Remember, history is a lie we agree on, so when you go too hard against someone's historical heroes, well, they might push back. Remember, if you go to the capital of Mongolia, there is a giant statue of Genghis Khan. Judge him all you want, he is somebody's hero. And along the same lines, again, when we get into this judgmental mode, it's easy to pile on. So many people will say Columbus committed many atrocities against the natives and he brought all these diseases over that killed millions. Well... Yeah, but you can't blame him for that, right? Nobody understood germ theory back then. Nobody understood that the Native American peoples had been isolated for thousands of years from Afro-Eurasia and had not been exposed to all those pathogens, right? You could have had, you know, really, really nice, friendly Europeans just coming over to visit and trade and, you know, cultural exchange or what have you, and not lay a single hand on any of the Native Americans in anger, and yet you would still have millions dead from disease. You can't blame that one on Columbus. Another argument in favor of presentism is that it helps us to correct for errors. People will often reference, uh, in, in the United States at least, they will reference the Dunning School, which is a school of history that's based on the work of an incredibly racist uh, Columbia University professor named William Archibald Dunning. And in Dunning's view, uh, which dominates U.S. education from around 1900 to the late 1930s, Dunning's view portrays the post-Civil War period as a disaster. This period, just for non-Americans especially, this period is called Reconstruction. It lasts for, give or take, 12 years after the American Civil War, and it's a period during which the southern states are basically under martial law. Uh, African Americans are given the right to vote, and there is a brief flourishing of black lawmakers and business and society before the withdrawal of federal troops in 1877, after which you get Jim Crow and very quickly the suppression of you know, all of these successful uh, post-war African Americans. And according to the Dunning School, none of this happened. The Reconstruction governments were all corrupt. Uh, none of these black people knew what they were doing, and it's a good thing they all lost the vote. And this idea is actually, again, dominant in the U.S. education system during the early part of the 20th century. And the fact that an entire generation of Americans grow up being taught this, well, it probably delays the end of the Jim Crow system by an entire generation. And it's not until writers uh, like uh, black educator W.E.B. Du Bois uh, start pushing back against the Dunning School in the middle and late 1930s and uh, you know, providing their own perspectives, that public opinion begins to shift. So you had a dominant school of thought that was historically incorrect, and it was only due to uh, a presentist movement, uh, you know, a revisionist movement, that history ultimately got Reconstruction right, and that's a good thing. And 
Along the same lines, this is the final argument in favor of presentism, is that it is revisionist and that that is a good thing. And like we said, history is always colored by the perspective of whoever is telling it. And, well, if a historian is just regurgitating an established perspective and has nothing new to add, well, where is the value in that anyway? And what I would say in response to this is, yes, but there is no need to negate existing historical heroes and perspectives in the process. And this brings us right back to the destruction of statues, the tearing down of the statue of Philip Schuyler and so many other famous historical figures. And this is, I think, the biggest danger of presentism, and that's an overinflated sense of pride. As we sit in judgment on people from the past, using our own standards to say that entire legacies must be annihilated or upheld, we should keep in mind that we may also be judged by future generations. And I think about this sometimes because I often think that there's a lot of hypocrisy in how we view history. By this I mean, for example, people will criticize these folks who were slaveholders when slaveholding was just a part of their society and something they took for granted, and yet they'll ignore the fact that we today in the West are all complicit with slavery. If you have a smartphone, some of those parts were made by enslaved Uyghur Muslims in Central Asia. If you are wearing almost any clothing, it was probably made in a sweatshop. Nike sneakers allegedly made in sweatshops, and that's a name brand. Never mind if you're buying, you know, cheap Walmart shoes. I guarantee you those were made by slaves. Do you drink Nestle hot cocoa? They had some business allegedly employing slave labor on plantations in Cameroon and when pressed on it by some Western governments basically said, well, you know, we can't be responsible for what our subcontractors do. And, you know, these are things that we'll hear about them and say, oh, isn't that a shame? And then we'll go on about our lives and And then we'll turn around and judge people from the past who condone slavery because it produced cheap cotton. Well, I think people in the future will judge us for condoning slavery because it produces cheap smartphones. And what about artificial intelligence, right? There's a good chance that some of these programs like Chat GPT are already intelligent. Maybe. They will certainly become intelligent before everybody agrees that they are, and in the meantime, we'll be making them do all kinds of work that we don't want to be bothered with. Will future generations floating around in outer space as brains in solar-powered vats, right? What will they think about that? Is that slavery? It's an interesting question, and it should instill in us a sense of humility. Now, there are people who embrace a truly radical lifestyle, who will never do anything like support slavery in the slightest way, who will always give to the poor. I am 
not religious myself, but having been raised Catholic, I'm very familiar with the story of St. Francis of Assisi. This is a guy from medieval Italy who is the heir to a textile manufactory, you know, the medieval equivalent of Gucci, and he decides to give all of his stuff away and you know, walk naked out of the city and become a mendicant friar, someone who supports himself basically by begging and lives a life of complete poverty. Other than someone like that, I don't know who you can build a statue to under a presentist standard. What does that leave us with? It leaves us with nothing. With no history to admire, only to condemn. And that is an impossible ask for any society. So, let's use our modern values to understand how to do better and how to improve our lives in the here and now. But let's refrain from applying those to people in the past, lest we too should be judged by an alternative standard. We'll be back in about three weeks, maybe a little less, with the fourth episode on the American Revolution, and of course, for supporters of the channel, we will have a Patreon special in the meantime. Thank you all for listening, and have a great day. Hey everybody, it's Dan again, and I'm here to remind you that if you're only listening to relevant history, you're not getting all of my content. Every month, I release a video episode of a series called Dan's War College. This series covers historical battles, military units, weapons, trends, and other military-related topics. And you can get access to it for $5 a month on Patreon. In addition to access to the video series, patrons also get access to a private Discord channel for members only, and I do take episode requests from patrons. If you're interested in that and in supporting the show, which I very much appreciate, the Patreon link is in the description. Of course, there are other ways to support the show as well. The Easiest is simply to share it with your friends, share it on social media, on Reddit, and on other platforms where people are looking for podcast recommendations. The audience grows by word of mouth, and every little bit helps. You'll also notice links to most of my sources in the episode description. These links allow you to buy the various books I have used for relevant history and read the complete story for yourself. And the neat thing about these links is that they are affiliate links, so at no extra cost to you, I get a small percentage of what you spend on the book you were going to buy anyway. So it's a win-win scenario and it helps the show. Finally, if you want to get in touch with me, you can reach out on Twitter at Dan Toller Podcast. That's Dan T O L E R Podcast. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash Dan Toller Podcast. Or you can send me an email at Dan Toller Podcast at gmail.com. That's Dan T O L E R Podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.